Brunel's recuperation after the Thames Tunnel is a really interesting time. He starts to find that absolute core that cannot be damaged in any way. And that enables him to fight on and to not be defined by his past failures. And that resilience, I think, is an extraordinary characteristic for anyone to have. Then, in 1829, Brunel, still convalescing, but with a newfound determination to realize his vast ambitions, relocated to Bristol. There he would plot his next move, the high-profile project that would revolutionize Britain. He was this man with a very tall stovepipe hat who would turn up and make amazing things happen and solve problems that nobody else could solve. The Clifton Suspension Bridge. At the time it was originally designed, in 1829, it was the longest in the world. Its creator, the 23-year-old Isambard Kingdom Brunel. But winning the competition to construct it pushed Brunel to his absolute limits. Brunel at this time has been sent to recuperate in Bristol. So uh, presumably he picked up the newspaper, saw the announcement of the bridge competition, and within about a week, he's got out. He's surveyed the whole of the gorge. He's learned about its history, about its botany. He's identified five different sites where a bridge could feasibly be built that will cross the gorge. So the competition drawing um, that we have here is one of four which he entered into the competition. When you look at it, you realise that Brunel isn't just thinking of a spanning bridge from one side to the other. He's uh, looking at the way it's going to fit in with the local geology and uh, the look and feel of the area as well. I think he was really attracted by not just the fact that he could apply and try and get a job and, and try and make a name for himself, but also for the picturesque uh, setting of the bridge. The Avon Gorge is spectacular and the bridge going across it would really be a visually very appealing thing. Brunel was trying to catch the eye of Thomas Telford, a respected civil engineer and the competition judge. But Telford proved a tough nut to crack. Telford stuck to the idea that the 600 foot span is the maximum span for suspension bridge. Brunel disagreed, and his submission was double that, double that. Telford was worried about the impact of crosswinds on Brunel's bridge. But Isambard believed that the use of short suspension rods at the centre of the span, bringing the chains down to the level of the deck, would combat the wind. One of the really interesting things about Isambard was the amount of creativity that he showed in his ideas and his ability to kind of imagine up things that had really never been done before. And Thomas Telford looks through all of the designs that have been submitted and dismisses them all. He decides that actually none of them are good enough. Brunel, he enters the competition and loses. He loses, he doesn't win, doesn't win it. But he wants it, he knows this is a big opportunity. After the designs have been rejected, the bridge committee asked Thomas Telford to design a bridge which they can submit to Parliament to grant the act to allow the project to go ahead. Now, Thomas Telford's design is in a Gothic style. It's quite fancy. It doesn't really fit with the natural setting. And a lot of local people object to the style of it. Bristolians and Brunel were united in their dislike of Telford's design. As the distance between the opposite rocks was considerably less than what had always been considered within the limits to which suspension bridges might be carried, the idea of going to the bottom of such a valley for the purpose of raising, at great expense, two intermediate supporters hardly occurred to me. After the first competition, um, Brunel is writing letters to his father and Mark Brunel sends him 
a little bit of a jokey sketch of a design for a bridge across the gorge with a giant pagoda in the middle. And some people view this as being a, a, a serious design and that Mark Brunel perhaps is a little bit out of touch with what's happening in Bristol. But I think the reality is that they're both having a bit of an in-joke about Thomas Telford and his overly elaborate bridge design. Brunel claimed that his bridge would cost £10,000 less to build than Telford's, the equivalent of over a million pounds today. Following disquiet over the cost and local objections, a second competition was held, and Isambard was offered a second chance. In the second competition, the bridge committee took Thomas Telford's concerns into consideration. They asked Brunel to adapt his design and add an abutment structure, which would shorten the span to mean that there was less danger of damage in high winds. He then revises the design for the towers because he's chosen a, a castle design and the bridge committee are very concerned that that's a little old fashioned and people won't like it. So he revises that to an Egyptian inspired design. Despite these modifications, the bridge committee was still not convinced. Brunel starts to nobble contacts in the city. He's a man, amongst other abilities, well, obviously one of diplomacy when needed, to be able to persuade other people to go along with the vision, which he knew was correct. He must be incredibly impatient. But you've got to talk them along, these slow, plodding people, because he knew that was part of his job as well. Brunel's powers of persuasion eventually sway the doubters. The plans are re-examined, he wins the commission and is appointed project manager. Even his Egyptian-inspired designs for the supporting towers are unanimously approved, to Isambard's delight. Of all the wonderful feats I have performed since I have been in this part of the world, I think yesterday I performed the most wonderful. I produced unanimity amongst 15 men who were all quarrelling about the most ticklish subject, taste. In June 1831, construction work on the bridge begins. Isambard had already demonstrated impressive resilience, but now, with the job finally underway, it was his willingness to embrace risk that came firmly to the fore. As the bridge was being built, Brunel constructed something called the Suspended Traveller, and that was an iron bar which crossed the gorge from one side to the other with a wicker basket hanging from it. And workmen would get into this basket and they would whiz across the gorge, in effect, kind of like a zip line. And there's a bit of an apocryphal tale that one day the basket got stuck. Brunel goes out on this damn wire in another basket to free the stuck basket. And he climbed out and somehow lifted the little pulley wheels back onto the bar. It was brave. Imagine, about that gorge, stuck basket, anything could have happened. So because Brunel was very often on site and at the heart of the action, it's quite easy to see where this story came from because if there was an engineer who would have climbed out on a bar and released a basket mechanism, uh, Brunel would have been the one to have done it. Designing and constructing the world's longest suspension bridge required enormous intellectual as well as physical courage. The other side of the risk, of course, is psychological risk. The bravery is also incredible because because he's pushing always at the edge of things, inventing, always inventing machines and ways of doing things, but it's always a risk, isn't it? Always a terrible risk, or so risk of failure, of course. The challenges of building the Clifton Suspension Bridge were to accomplish something that had never been done before on a very grand scale, uh, working at this enormous height, trying to cross a huge span. Building the longest bridge in the world is an amazing challenge for such a young man. The Clifton Suspension Bridge showcased Brunel, the engineering radical. But in October 1831, just four months after work began, construction came to a shuddering halt. 
as Bristolians took to the streets in support of political reform. There were riots in Bristol, and the riots are serious, and ultimately four people publicly executed. It's a very appalling story, but it stops work on his bridge. The whole project just ground to a halt for pretty much five years because of the rioting. Investors in the project completely lost confidence in it. They didn't want to invest in a major infrastructure build. They were, I think, much more concerned about their own personal circumstances at this time and the way that the political shift might change things for them. As the city descends into chaos, and the status quo is threatened, a very different Brunel emerges. But do the riots, Brunel decides to prop up law and order, the establishment, you might say, and becomes a special constable, which means he was doing his bit physically to control and suppress uh, rioters who are rioting for vote. Two sides of him working together, seemingly in contrast, in a way, radical engineer, ruthless and logical, but also there's Brunel, the um, conservative, very much a man of the old world, putting down the people, even though the people have a very good reason to be upset, and, and even in the face of the army being used against some pretty aggressive stuff. But he's on the side of the establishment. Brunel is, he is he's ahead of his time when thinking about physical problems and solutions and engineering, but politically he's, he's right where you would expect a progressive, well-heeled 19th century gentleman to be, which is to stand up for effectively a liberal laissez-faire economic system. That system allows him to pursue the things that he wants to in engineering and business terms. <laughs>